welcome to the Women's and Gender Studies Colloquium presentation. And this is co-sponsored by the Race and Gender Project and the Women's Center. This is our second colloquium this semester. The first was last week when we presented a faculty panel discussion about the impact of Adrian Rich's work on our scholarship and our teaching. Five faculty members from across the College of Humanities and Social Sciences participated. Today's presentation, Veganism, Feminism, and Healthy Living, will be made by Fanny Fuentes, a graduate of the Women's Studies Department and a master gardener, and Jennifer Gannett, animal and environmental activist. I also want to add that um, Fanny is on the brink of opening a vegan restaurant in Montclair, and perhaps she'll tell you a little bit more about that later. So at this time, um, Jennifer Gannett, um, our first presenter, will uh, speak with us. And I want you to know this presentation is being videotaped. Okay? And please you know, develop questions as the presentation goes on, so you'll have lots to say afterwards and ask. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, especially Arlene, for bringing me here. Um, my name's Jen Gannett. I have a varied background. I um, studied environmental and animal law at Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland. And I went on to work for a while as an attorney in the animal protection litigation section of one of the main animal welfare groups in the country. I've now kind of turned my attention to doing some other things around helping people make healthy eating choices. I work as a vegan coach sometimes, and I'm also really involved in humane education, um, helping children understand the impacts of our choices in terms of environmental issues, as well as um, helping sow the seeds of compassion. So I'm gonna start my presentation, this is really what I call like the clean presentation. I'm not going to show you guys like really depressing and scary pictures of animals being abused in our food system, but I want you to be assured that that does happen and things that happen to animals that are considered food would be illegal if they occurred to a dog or a cat. So just bear that in mind. Our, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. The other thing I just want to mention is I'm going to be rushing through this because we did have a little bit of that technical difficulty. And while I can stay 10 minutes later, I know that some of you may not be able to. So I'm going to go quickly. Save your questions. And I would be really, really happy to hear questions or thoughts at the end of my presentation. <clears throat> So I want to begin by by mentioning the fact that I think a lot of you may may either think this or have experience interactions with people who think this, that feminism is still considered radical in our society by a lot of people, or a lot of people want to distance themselves from any notion of feminism. I have a lot of friends who are women who love the idea of, and men, I should say, who love the idea of equal pay, parity in child care, and many, many other things that our reproductive issue, issues, um, and many other things that people consider feminist, but they would say, oh, I don't, I'm not a feminist, but X, Y, Z, they support these concepts. Um, the same thing with veganism. A lot of people do consider that a very radical way of living, thinking, and eating. I would suggest to you that you actually don't need to consider either of those concepts radical, and that they can be easily integrated into people's more mainstream lives. Um, I think I'm a good example of that because I'm just a suburban mom at the end of the day. In terms of uh, the invisibility and exploitation of animals who are raised for food, take a minute to think about whether you've ever met a cow, whether you've ever eaten a cow, have you met a pig, eaten a pig, have you met a chicken, eaten a chicken. Uh, the other thing to remember is that most meat, eggs, and dairy products that are offered for sale in our country are owned by large corporations. I think you guys all know that that means that there's a bottom line that always needs to be answered to. And what that generally means is that animals within the product, food production system are treated as units of uh, commodity. It's essential to have females on your farm that you're producing meat for, whether you're whether you're making, um, whether you're a pork producer, whether you're a dairy farm, or whether you have broiler 
uh, broiler animals for uh, chicken. In order for there to be more females, there needs to be more reproduction. These animals have no choice, obviously. They don't have any control over when they have their offspring, and they're deprived of their ability to engage in their natural behaviors when they function as economic units. Animals in the food production system are certainly considered property. We actually consider, the legal system considers all animals property. So your dog may be super part of your family, but to the court, generally speaking, it's changing a little bit now. It's the same as a chair. Not always, but that it's, the possibility exists. Animals within the food production system obviously don't have any autonomy and have very few legal protections. There's farmed animal exemptions in the legal codes of all of the states in our country, um, which means that you can treat uh, a cow, for example, in a certain way that is considered standard farming practices or standard agricultural practices. And it's possible that if you treated an animal, a dog or a cat or a companion animal, in that same way, that would be considered abuse. Um, in terms of social constructs and our assigned roles for both women and animals, um, I invite you to think about the mythical assigned roles that we have, for example, for dairy cows especially, that they love giving their milk. We think about that they're just happy and placidly eating grass and, you know, when the farmer rings the bell, they come in and they're excited to get milked and they're happily mooing. That's not really the case. It may be the case for a very small handful of dairy farmers who have like a, you know, sort of a hobby farm and they love their their animal, I'm not saying that all farmers don't love their animals, they may or may not, um, but that's not the case at all. Industrial and intensive milking of cows is actually a very different process and it's very unpleasant. The same with laying hens, breeding sows. Does everyone know what a sow is? Female pig. So I, again, I invite you to explore and think about the realities for these non-human um, animals. Humane meat, has everyone here heard of this idea that there's humane meat? So I'm just going to talk about a couple of myths surrounding that that don't necessarily get as much time. One is that there's no, there's no humane way of transporting your animal to the slaughter facility. Okay, so even if you have, um, for example, I'll just use pigs as an example. So if you have some, some pigs that have been, have been raised in maybe a less confined area and they've been treated maybe a little bit ni more nicely than uh, animals on a what's called a CAFO, which stands for confined animal feeding operation. Those are huge, gigantic um, factory farms. So I'm going to, I invite you to think about maybe there is a nice pig farm somewhere where the farmers lovingly treating them like pets. At the end of the day, they still need to get transported to the slaughter facility and there is no difference between the way those animals are treated and the animals on a CAFO are, tr are treated during transport. There's very little oversight when it comes to transport. Um, there is something called a 28-hour law, which means that you can't keep the animal going without giving it um, exercise, food, and water for 28 hours, but that's, that's a long time. You, may, you could do it for 18 hours. That's still a long time to be an animal being transported um, say in Nebraska in the middle of winter being trucked from a, a hog facility to the slaughterhouse. It's very cruel and it's very um, uncomfortable and many animals actually do die in transport. This is a picture of just chickens being transported. There's no, um, you know, you can see there's no protection. They're not like, they don't have their chicken seat belts on. These cages that you can see on the back are battery cages. Has anyone ever heard of that term? Yeah, battery cages are cages where they um, s put many hens together in one, um, in one cage and then they stack them on top of each other. And these are usually in long, long sheds. So there's thousands and thousands of chickens together. And it's, very, you know, that's, it's actually a very cruel system of confinement. So again, these animals, I don't know if they came from a CAFO or not. I would suggest that they did. Um, but this is the way that they're routinely routinely transported. I have no way of knowing if these were um, 
egg-laying hens or if they were broilers that are, were raised for meat, there's a little bit of a difference. Slaughter, if you think about humane meat, there's no different slaughter facility that the animals go to. They're not going to the special loving slaughterhouse. They're going to generally the same meat processors that CAFO factory farms are using. Um, and the, I referenced the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, some kind, sometimes called the HMSA. Um, there's really, this is, the, this is the main thrust of it, that all animals must be rendered insensible to pain by a single blow or a gunshot or an electrical, chemical, or other means that is rapid and effective before they're shackled, hoisted, thrown, cast, or cut. Um, that, that doesn't always happen, and the enforcement is up to the USDA. They have something called the Food Safety and Inspection Service, and that is a very overworked unit of our government, although maybe not right now. Um, and the, I will just tell you without being very graphic, that it's not uncommon for these animals to not be rendered insensible to pain before they're hoisted and shackled and thrown cast or cut or dragged through their um, electric bath or going through the defeather machine. Chickens, turkeys, and other poultry are exempt from this law. That means that they have no protection in terms of even the, that small amount of protection that the HMSA get, is supposed to be giving. Um, other animals is not afforded to these birds and um, of course if you think about the number of chickens that are killed each year they're by far the most the, the highest number of animals that we we use for um, for meat consumption I invite you to take a look this is just a little picture the, of um, some Purdue fit and easy thin sliced chicken breasts, but if you think about the marketing that's going on, even just while you're looking at the label, I mean, that is a gorgeous, gorgeous house. I want to, I was like, I love that house and I want to live there, it has a beautiful tree and we could put a swing for my son and it would be so nice, but that's not really necessarily, in fact, I will tell you, I highly doubt that that is where these chickens were raised. Um, fit and easy makes it sound like it's going to be very healthy. Um, USDA process verified, if you can see sort of toward the bottom on the left, that is sort of a self-policing process where you can sign up and say that you are complying with certain regulations, um, but there's not a lot of enforcement. All vegetarian diet, that's a, diff that's a, um, a way that they've used to reframe the fact that some animals have been fed um, the remnants of the pro meat processing. Uh, raised cage-free, well, that's good. That just means they weren't just like in those terrible battery cages that I was showing you a picture of before on the truck. Um, but it's not super common to raise uh, meat, chickens that are used for meat, in cages because that impacts the quality of the meat. This is just a little about the USDA process verified. You can see um, the second, this is a lot of text, so I'm just going to point out. Companies with, this is the second paragraph, with approved USDA process verified programs, can, this is one of the selling points that the USDA has. They can make marketing claims associated with their process verified points. So you can sign up for this USDA process verified, and one of the great things about it is you can say that you're USDA process verified. It's kind of um, circular. I'm going to switch over now quickly to talk about some behaviors of farmed animals. I know you guys can all read this, but what I've done is I'm going through some of the main animals that are used in food production in our country. I'm going to talk. I'm going to give you um, natural behaviors and what goes on with them in confinement, and so you can kind of notice chickens, especially um, hens. Love like you've heard of the expression "mother hen." There was a reason for that because. Chickens love to take care of their chicks. Like they will, sp I ha have, has anyone seen this before? They'll like really spread their wings out to like keep their chicks nearby. And when they're out in, um, in a situation where they can indulge in their natural behaviors, they will be cheeping and peeping and clucking to each other all the time. They're always within very close range of each other. The mother will almost always run to her chick's aid if she thinks that like, there's any iota of a chance of danger. Um, they certainly are not allowed to raise their chicks together in 
um, the food production system, and they're denied their ability to engage in their natural behaviors. They are often de-beaked. That means that the tip of their beak is is um, clipped off, so they won't peck the other hens that are in their cage to death or in cause uh, serious injury. Because, of course, a hen that is dead does not lay eggs. Um, this is the inside of a, a chicken confinement facility. This is a CAFO. And you can see, I mean, it's just, it's not a good situation. The chickens on the top row probably have it best because they don't have um, the waste from all of the other chickens dripping down on them. And they're a little bit more at eye level, whereas, not that, not that these chickens are given, a lot of the, um, these farms are automated, so that's, it's not like there's someone coming through all the time, checking in on them, doing night checks, making sure they're okay. They're just in there to lay until they die or until they're shipped off to be slaughtered. And usually they're put into soup and things like that because their meat isn't um, a high enough quality to sell as like a chicken breast or something like that. But you can see being on the bottom would be the worst in this particular scenario. This is a, a mother hen that I know that if you look closely, I'm sorry I don't have a close-up of this, but um, those are all her chicks around her. And she, they're just hanging out in the grass and... I wish I had audio for this because they were cheeping like mad to each other. It's very sweet. Um, turning to pigs. Pigs are, I think probably everyone in this room knows that pigs are considered to be one of the most intelligent animals that they have data on. Um, they're certainly considered to be as smart or smarter than dogs. And there's a lot of information coming out right now that dogs are actually extremely smart and pigs are even maybe smarter. They, they know. I think Fanny has some more information about like p pigs being able to like play video games and things like that. So um, they really have some very specific natural behaviors that they like to do. They love to root. They love to build their nests. They like to go in the mud. They're very, very curious. That actually gets them in trouble sometimes because um, I know you've heard the expression curiosity killed a cat. I think if pigs were allowed to roam a little bit more, they would be in trouble. But they um, are very playful generally. And they, of course, are great parents for the most part and love reading, reading, raising their, animal, their, their piglets. Um, does everyone here know what a gestation crate is? Gestation crates are in the news a lot right now because the New Jersey legislature um, passed a ban on gestation crates. Gestation crates are very small crates where pigs are kept during their period of confinement when they are pregnant and not long after they've had their their piglets. Um, they're very, very, very small spaces, and the animals are not even. They're basically not much. They're um, rectangular, and they're not much bigger than the pig herself. So she actually doesn't really have any room to move. Um, they were banned in New Jersey. Governor Christie vetoed that law that was passed at the end of the summer. And um, there's a movement right now for the legislature to actually overturn that veto. So you might be seeing that a little bit here and there in the news. One reason I saw it is because Martha Stewart, who I think some of you might know is originally from Nutley, submitted a letter to the <laughs> assembly asking them to overturn the, the veto. So this can sometimes make strange bedfellows. Here's a, here's a very clean looking um, animal intensive, intensive confinement facility. Um, the picture on the right where I'm kind of mousing over, these are called farrowing crates. They're a little bit different than gestation crates because they allow the room for the piglets. But you can see there's the animal is squeezed right in there. and. She's not allowed to move. I mean, this is how she is kept. It's not like they're only there for a little bit of time a day. This is her life. And then down here, these are just. This is just another picture of the intensive confinement that these animals are kept in. This is at. These pictures are at a sanctuary. These pigs are actually from uh, a tractor trailer truck. Uh, the driver of a tractor trailer truck that was bound had pigs bound for slaughter pulled over, I think, in right in the border, like somewhere on the border, right inside or outside of Washington, D.C., and just walked away and left these animals. So some of the sanctuaries nearby, not that there are that many sanctuaries, but some of the sanctuaries were able to take some of these pigs, and that's what these pictures are from. These are pictures of pigs that have been bound for slaughter and ended up, luckily, 
at a sanctuary where they are allowed to mud bathe. This is a picture of my niece when she was very young, petting one of them. And um, I don't know if you can see very well, but the last picture, this is kind of what they like to do, is hang out, just be near each other, but not obviously crammed into the same space. They, get to, they choose to be near each other. In terms of cattle, cattle, you know, like to graze on their grass and hang out in the sun and be, so, be in their social groups. It's important to remember that um, just, you know, as dogs and cats that we know very well, all of them have their own personality. You probably know shy dogs and mean dogs and friendly dogs and crazy dogs. That exists all throughout all of these animals. I mean, not every cow is going to be the same as every steer, as every pig, that kind of thing. So you'll have a diversity of personalities within all of these animals. Um, but they, they're very social, and they jump when they're excited. It's very cute. Um, I imagine you guys have thought about this already, but in order to produce milk, cows need to be kept pregnant. They need to continuously have calves so that they will biologically be triggered to produce milk. So they don't get a choice, and they're not out like choosing their steer boyfriend. It's an artificial process. Their reproduction is an artificial process. The calves are usually removed from their mom very soon after birth. Male calves are sent um, away, and they are set aside to be sent to um, be raised as veal calves and sent to slaughter very, very early on as babies. Um, and then some cattle will live on lots. These are cattle that are, have been maybe raised on a range, which is probably the best thing if you're uh, an animal in the food production system because you do get some time um, around a year or so, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less to live out. You know, it's not the, always that great though. I mean, I'm not sure if you have all been reading in the news, but there were some terrible storms in um, the Midwest and I think like North Dakota and South Dakota, and they've lost about 75,000 range cattle that just died because they froze to death due to this sudden storm. They didn't have any shelter. So, I mean, I'm saying it might be the best, but it's not always great. Um, this is a picture of a finishing lot, which is where these range cattle would go before they are slaughtered for beef. And then these are, um, this is just a long row of dairy cattle. This is, um, this is my son and I were visiting. This is a steer. The um, breed that he is is called a Jersey cow. And he was meant for to become a veal calf. And uh, this is, he's about two. He's huge in this picture. In this picture, he's about two. And he's he, a huge, huge guy, but very sweet. You can see he's like actually trying to like rub against me like a dog would like to get more pets. Um, he's so, so super cute. And then this is a picture of me nursing my son. And this is a picture of a cow that I once knew when I would spend some time on a dairy farm. And her name was Friendly Cow because she was one of the, um, the most friendly cows I've ever met. Super, super sweet girl. Um, and the, the answer, of course, is that I got to keep my son and I got to nurse him when I wanted to. And when we were done with that, it was time to move on. And I get to raise him and help him live out his biological life, whereas her um, offspring were taken from her very quickly, and if they were male, they were sent away to be slaughtered. I'm going to switch over quickly. I'm going to go through this, even though I think it's so important. Um, the environmental concerns that we're facing as a global society are currently impacting women disproportionately. Um, this is a great quote from the executive director of the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, um, and you can see most affected by climate change are women and children who walk long distances in search of water and food for their families. That's currently the way it is. Um, Representative Lee also had this great, great comment about um, the disproportionate impact of climate change on, especially on marginalized women, po female populations. This is just a quick look at um, why global climate change is impacting women disproportionately because we're looking at things like um, crop failure, food shortage, and water shortage. Those are leading to things like disease, displacement, and conflict, and all of those tend to see women shouldering the huge brunt 
of the outfall of all of those things. Um, I'm sorry I can't spend like two hours talking about this slide alone because I think it is really important for us to keep in mind. Um, but what does that have to do with us and the way we eat? Well, raising animals for food takes a lot of water for one thing. Um, it's estimated that it's 300 gallons of water for a person t per day for a person to be eating a plant-based diet. Uh, 4,000 gallons a day for a person's supply of animal-based food. I'm not going to, well, water law is its own, um, its own very weird situation in our country. It's divided depending on the geographical location of where you're talking about, what state you're talking about. But in the West, there's um, a consumptive use to retain your water right. So if you have right to, rights to water, which is really important in agriculture, you need to keep using it or you will lose that right. So that means even if you don't need it, you're going to be using it so you can preserve your right to use it in the future. That's for feeding your animals. That's for growing crops for your animals. That's possibly for if there's a slaughter facility nearby cleaning. Um, there's a lot of uh, intricacies around that. You should also know that it's highly subsidized and that you probably all know that many rivers now in the West are running dry because uh, of the irrigation that is happening upstream. Again, another environmental concern is the energy use that is implicit in animal agriculture. 10% of the energy in our country is consumed by the food industry, which is a pretty big proportion. Um, national, natural gas is where we get the hydrogen for synthetic fertilizers that we put on the crops that we then feed to the animals. Um, transporting the food is a big thing. You guys have probably heard about this um, idea called the, your fork print, which is like your carbon footprint for your food. The average um, American food travels 1,500 miles to the consumer's table. And grain-fed beef re requires 35 calories in to the cow for every one calorie of beef that's produced. Air pollution is also a problem. There's a huge problem with um, ammonia emissions in our country coming from CAFOs. Some people are reporting, some sources are reporting that approximately 80% of ammonia emissions are from CAFOs. That's a, that's a sobering thought. Um, so what's, why is that bad? Eutrophication, which is um, the addition of nutrients to a body of water, which then changes the biochemistry of the water. It leads to dead zones. Um, you probably are aware that in the Gulf of Mexico, there are huge dead zones. Ch Chesapeake Bay, not very far from us, have significant dead zones where life just cannot live. Um, you can also see that there's damage to sensitive crops, acidification of soil, which is really bad news when you're thinking about growing food whether you're going to eat it yourself if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, or you're going to feed it to an animal if you're a meat eater. You don't want soil acidification. Um, of course, ammonia causes respiratory disease, smog, there's acid rain concerns. Uh, in terms of water pollution, CAFOs use a number of um, agents to encourage and speed growth in the animals that are on their their facilities. So antibiotics, hormones, and other drugs are actually in the waste of these CAFOs. Uh, CAFO manure can sometimes be sprayed onto the land nearby. In terms of, sometimes that happens in an over generous way, and there's a runoff that goes into the um, water supply, which means that then the water supply is polluted. There are also CAFOs that have lagoons, which are, you know, giant holding pits for the animal waste, a hog produces eight times the amount of waste per day as a human. So if you mo start multiplying that by in the thousands, and that's just on one hog farm, that adds up to a lot of waste. Um, when lagoons fail, it can send, this is all untreated waste. It's not like it's going through a sewage treatment facility or anything like that. Um, when lagoons fail, it can cause really bad problems for nearby streams and rivers. Um, climate change is also, uh, 
being massively impacted by animal agriculture. 9% of carbon dioxide and 37% of methane. Methane is not as well known as carbon dioxide, but it's 20 times more effective at trapping uh, heat in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. Um, and we also have, a, I, I talked about this earlier, but synthetic fertilizer pr uh, production is also an issue. Um, and just, <laughs> I was, I love this quote. Um, one expert noted that in terms of nitrous oxide, it makes methane look like a piker with regard to its heat trapping capability. So animal agriculture does currently play, play and has been playing a big part in climate change. Um, this guy was a professor of agricultural economics and said that you hear less and less from proponents of CAFOs calling for good science because the good science is basically saying that CAFOs are responsible for a lot of things such as environmental abuse and um, health problems that are being experienced in surrounding communities. I'm going to quickly switch before I turn it over to Fanny to just give you a little bit of food for thought no pun intended, about um, the way that women are targeted by the food production industry, uh, especially mothers. M uh, moms represent a $2.4 trillion potential market. And in most homes, moms are the decision makers around what meals will be served to families. So that is a big, big chunk of change for a lot of different companies that are closely watching trends and buying habits. Um, there was a survey taken at the beginning of the year that said 96% of American mothers were planning to make changes to the way that their families were eating this year. That's a huge number. And so you can be sure that corporations and companies, including animal agriculture, are trying to figure out what that trend is so they can um, capitalize, on it, capitalize on it the best that they can. In order to sort of maybe consider lessening your impact, your personal impact, or maybe your family's impact. I want to put this out here. There are three R's, sort of like recycled, like the recycling um, triangle. Reduce, so reduce your consumption of animal-based foods. I think Fanny's going to give a couple tips and a personal story about that. Um, refine, which means refine what you buy. Like, think about what are the worst production systems that you, in your mind, that you feel like. Um, you've been exposed to or have researched and avoid products from there. Then replace those animal products with a plant-based product, which Fanny, again, will touch on and has done a great job of setting up some, um, some resources in the back. Eating is a political and social action, environmental destruction, public health, workers' rights, decaying rural, rural communities, world hunger, and global poverty are all deeply affected by our eating choices. Um, this is a woman who founded one of the sanctuaries in upstate New York. I believe that this is true. I could talk about this with you guys all for hours and hours, any one tiny little bit of this, but um, instead I've had to kind of quickly give you an overview. But if you have any questions, um, please, and you want to ask them at the end of Fanny's presentation, or if you want to come up to me afterwards, please, please do. I'll also put my cards out in the back. Um, I only have my coaching cards. I'm sorry, I don't have my other cards. But you can always contact me. I would really be happy to hear from you. And you know, engage in further uh, discussion and dialogue about these issues because they're really important and it's really an honor to be given the chance to talk to you guys about it. Thank you. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to Arlene, to the Women's Center for Refreshments and Sponsorship along with the Women and Gender Studies Colloquium committee, race and gender, um, and all the staff who made this happen. I really appreciate it. For those of you who are watching this, thank you so much. We really appreciate speaking about this. And um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm thankful to be here. So I'm going to discuss how I went vegan. I'm just I'm going to speak about what feminism meant and means to me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my volunteer. Uh, story and how that changed me and made me realize that I really could go vegan and that I really needed to go vegan. And I'm going to try to get to Carol J. Adams. If I don't, I'm going to leave her picture, the book up. And I really encourage you to 
rent it, borrow it, um, get it on your iPod or iPad. Um, and that's Carol J. Adams wrote The Sexual Politics of Meat. And uh, she wrote that in the 80s. And it's, it's an amazing book. It makes all those connections between feminism and veganism and um, really allowed a lot of us to get the wording that we needed to make this um, connection. So I'm going to start with me. So I, um, I was a student of William Patterson, and I had to take a few years off. But when I came back, I was, I was ready with that revolutionary spirit. And I was going to do great in my classes. And I was going to change the world. So I'm, um, I'm doing it. We're all doing it. Um, so I, what I did when I came back, I enrolled in some women's studies classes. I joined the Feminist Collective on campus and um, eventually became president of the Feminist Collective. And by doing that, we raised awareness of the injustices. What was going on during the 90s was Congress, oh goodness, was fighting Bill Clinton and um, our reproductive rights were at stake. Um, abortion clinics were being bombed. Abortion doctors were being killed. It was really just similar to the cycle that we're kind of going through now. But we decided, you know, we're going to take this on. We're going to speak truth to power. We're going to be the voice for the voiceless. Um, so we organized rallies, bus trips. We did Take Back the Night, which still happens on campus, you know, raising awareness about domestic violence among young women or women in general. Um, battered women shelters. We did fundraisers for um, shelter our strengthen our sisters, right? Um, and so we did a huge caravan with all this clothing and toys and stuff for the kids. Um, and what, was the, what really came out of that um, was that we were able to network. So the feminists weren't alone on campus. It was, we, were, we were along with the sororities and the fraternities. We all met up. And um, like one of my good friends as president of the collective, Feminist Collective, was the SGA president. So we were, and he was in charge of his fraternities, blah, blah, blah. So it was just, we were really connected. And it just felt so odd, but it felt great that we had this unity as students working together, doing something that we felt was right and needed to be you know, acknowledged, like Take Back the Night. So, um, oh, here we go. So in learning about everything that was happening to women, um, children and seniors. That was part of the feminism um, that I really felt came out of the 60s and 70s was where women were able to talk about their experiences, what was happening at home, what was happening with their bosses, um, sexual harassment in the workplace. All of this communication started happening and um, As I was learning all these things in coming back to school, um, it was so overwhelming. It was just like, I can't believe this is, you know, women and children and seniors, we, we all have it so tough and it's so sad and what can we do? And, you know, in thinking about that, it never dawned on me to think about, you know, the animals that were, we were eating and what was happening to animals. Um, Alice Walker had said, um, as we talked of freedom and justice, one day for all, we sat down to steaks. I'm eating misery, she thought. And I took the first bite and spit it out. I kind of felt that way at one point when I started realizing, what am I doing? I, you know, I'm, I'm for, oh, and that's what I have right here. I, in 2003, I learned that pigs were as smart as a four-year-old, as Jan was saying. And I thought, oh my goodness, so they're smart? How can that be when we're treating them so horribly? I'm eating them. It's just, this seems really bizarre. I'm not going to eat any more pigs. I'm going to stop eating pigs. Um, cows, you're still getting eaten. Chickens, you're on the table. But pigs, you're smart. You're spared. And, um, and then it was, uh-oh, wait a minute. My parents live on the West Coast, and my mother makes some kick-butt chicharrones. What am I going to do when I can't have my pernil and my chicharrones? Wait a minute. Wait, oh, 
My mother's doing it because she loves me. She's preparing this meal with love, so I have to eat it. And then that Alice Walker thought comes in, and it's like, but what, what, I'm eating misery. Her love is given to me. This piece of meat is, is not love. So I had to reconsider a few things. I had to think about whether um, what I was doing was fair, it was convenient, and then I started learning some more things. So baby pigs know their names at two weeks old. Chickens are so smart, they can communicate with one another, as Jan was discussing, and I just felt like this really was not, not a good thing. I wasn't feeling good about it. I wasn't feeling that revolutionary spirit I had where I was in empowering women and saving um, the universe. This was, this was I'm, I'm not, somebody's doing something for me to have this meat on my plate. Um, someone's killing an animal, someone's torturing an animal for me to have this, so I'm not doing it but it's happening. I'm just not seeing it, but it's happening. So um, we were at this event, and um, it's a Clearwater Hudson Revival Festival. It's an environmental fair in um, upstate New York, Westchester. Right. And Croton on the Hudson, right, right. Oh, it's such a wonderful event. It happens in June. You should check it out, like the second or third week of June. And um, lots of music. Pete Seeger, it's just really wonderful. It's all day music, food, and Woodstock Farm Animal Sanctuary was there all by themselves, this little tabling. And um, I got on their newsletter, and I saw that they needed volunteers, so I said, I can do this. We can go volunteer. Now I'm going to take care of this. And so <laughs> my better half, when she found out that we were going to volunteer at a farm, uh, was giving me the stank eye because what are we doing? What's going on? Why are we going to a farm? Um, so we're volunteering, and um, <laughs> she, I said, it's, go it's in the Catskills in New York. It's beautiful, as you can see in the picture. It's just this lovely farm. We're going to have a great time. We just have to pack a vegan lunch, and we're going to go help. Okay, so she conceded. And um, we arrive at the farm, <laughs> and um, we arrive at the farm, and we go to the volunteer. So this is just, this is real. You know, like, what's going on, people? Um, we're drinking milk of another species. We're not, we're drinking cow's milk. We're drinking goat's milk. It's that, that milk belongs to that species, you know? And actually, now that I have this up and I get to break a little from my story, um, a lot of people have allergies to milk, lactose intolerant. There's also, um, milk is treated with a few things that really don't need to be in there. Um, and again, it's not our species. Um, it's made, mi cow's milk is made for a 500 pound cow. Um, so here we are, we're drinking up milk because they tell us we gotta drink milk. And that was another thing about feminism. It's like, wait a minute, we're challenging. We're speaking truth to power, patriarchy, hello. I wanna get paid the same as a man. I, uh, don't tell me what I can wear at work or don't tell me what I can wear out on the street. We're challenging patriarchy, but yet when it comes to food, we're just, oh, the USDA tells me I need vitamin D in my milk. I'm gonna drink my eight ounces of vitamin D. Um, <laughs> of milk for my vitamin D when vitamin D is free. You just step outside, 20 minutes in the sun, you get your vitamin D. So you really don't need milk. Um, or you can take, um, as Jen was saying, there's now, a, you can, um, what is that? S like spray. spray, right, a vitamin D spray. Or take your vitamins. Um, not so bad. Anyway. <clears throat> So we arrive at Woodstock, and um, here I am with some of the turkey residents who are just hanging out. And usually at these points, it was a little later in the day, so they're wondering, is this the human that's going to feed me? Because if it is, I'm going to be really nice. I'm going to hang out. I'm going to rub up on them because I want some food. And um, they were kind of doing that, and that was really cute. So, um, so we end up at the, at the sanctuary, and we go to the, um, so let me see, where's, I don't have it here right now. 
kind of looks like this, where this big piggy's at, the visitor center. And we go inside, and the volunteer says to us, okay, you're going to, oh, you know, you're new, you've never been here? Okay. <laughs> you're going to go over here, and you're going to take care of these two piglets. They just had hysterectomies because they found that piglets, um, like some women who don't have babies or when they get older might have problems with their ovaries, um, piglets also have that. Um, so, so they had had hysterectomies and uh, they were in the little infirmary which is about six feet wide and six, six feet long. And so I was like, yeah, we got this. We're going to clean this pen out. No problem. Best bet pen cleaning in the world. And uh, I said, uh, but I'm sorry, Amber, our volunteer, Amber, um, who's going to take the piglets out? Where do they go? And <laughs> she looks up, no, you have to clean it with the pigs in there. So I'm talking about a space this big, right? There's the two piglets are about 80 pounds each. Um, so they're bigger than any dog I've been around. And um, I look over at my better half, and she looks at me, and she's got that same look. She's giving me the stank eye. This was your idea. She, so she voices it. She, she just lips it so that the volunteer doesn't hear it. Now, this is your idea. You're going in there. So, okay. So here I go into the pen. And it's a good thing I had my galoshes on because these two girls were so happy to see someone in. Again, they might have thought I was feeding them. But they were just like bumping me up and smelling me and, uh, and chewing on me and <laughs> The whole nine yards is totally cute, and um, I, you know, it was all cute and fun until I went and got the mop in there, and they just started whipping the mop around. And what's on the mop? Well, it's their pee and their water, and just everything in that little pen was on me, and um, and I was loving it. I was just like, "Well, I could do this. I'm gonna. This is gonna be clean." So. Um, <laughs> in the middle, we're just like, oh, okay, so we got the mats out, and the girls are just, it's Eva and Pinky is who we had, and um, they're just so happy. Uh, this is Fern, just for a different view of the farm, and Fern is such a lovely goat. Um, so I'm showing you them in these envir this environment that they're choosing to do whatever they want to do, however they want to do it. Um, so... We get out, we go to dry the mats, we're gonna take a break, we're gonna eat our vegan lunch, we're gonna come back and we're gonna clean up. We're eating our lunch and we realize that the girls don't have the mats, they don't have any hay, they're slipping and sliding all over the place. So we were, all of a sudden we're like, oh my God, we have to get back, the girls are gonna slip. Um, they had their little hysterectomy, we gotta get back there. So we get back and sure enough, the girls are like, what took you so long? We've been slipping and sliding. Come on, man, let's get this going. And uh, so we get the mats down and we get the hay down. They're like, <laughs> they're chewing up on the hay, right? And so they're happy. And I finish throwing down the bit of hay. I turn around and they're like two peas in a pod. They're sleeping. They're doing, if anyone does yoga here, they're doing that breath of fire. They're <laughs> and they're just sleeping together. And so they were just so cute. And I was looking for a picture of that, and I don't have it, so I'm sorry. But they were really adorable. Trust me. Um, another view of the farm. Um, we just, so then after that, we were going to do the chickens. So we're off to clean the chicken coop. And my better half takes the coop, and I decide to take the scenic route and go in the back. Because when we walked in, all the chickens, again, a little late, the chickens are like, ooh, you're feeding us? OK, we're, we're going to follow you. And, they were like, where is she going? Forget about it. She's going back there. So I just went into the back, and they, nobody followed me. So I'm back there raking poo, right? Because that's what you do on a farm is you're raking poo. And um, I'm having this little serenity now moment, just zoning out. And all of a sudden, there's like 30 chickens around me. And I don't know if they were Len, hay, Len egg layers or broilers, but... Um, these girls were all over me, and they were pecking at my shoes, and they were pecking at each other, and just having their little social gathering. But they followed me in the back, because again, no one was there. So they were just either curious, hungry, you know, the welcome wagon, whatever. But they were in their, in their natural environment, just enjoying themselves. And this was something, um, in case I didn't preface this, um, I'm a city girl. So I hadn't been around animals, <laughs> farm animals, and, um, and that was quite an experience for me to, to, to see them and then to think about 
oh, I love my my、uh, Burger King chicken parmesan.、Mm, no, no, th- these babies were were enjoying their lives, and that chicken parmesan is is so so distant from what they are.、Um, Julia Child, and it's true. Julia Child said, "You know, oh, about ninety percent of birds that we eat are in a fecal bath before we cook them, and so that's what happens. They're actually in this water bath, all their bodies dead,、um, and it's got poo and all this yucky stuff, and so they have to wa- wash that with chlorine." Right, and then they can package it and salt it and sanitize it, and then you get to eat it as your chicken parmesan. Or in my case, I used to get to eat it as my chicken parmesan. And I decided after visiting the farm that I really couldn't do that anymore. I couldn't do that for myself. I couldn't do it to the animals, and I couldn't do it to the environment because I started learning what Jen was telling us. It's just a real bad scene. So at that point, we. We're at the farm, and just you know, four hours later, we're kind of like, okay, I think we know what we're gonna do. And this is what I think my better half was worrying about when she was giving me that stank eye, like, yeah, this is happening. We are going vegan. And so we ask our、um, volunteer, where can we go eat? Because we had only packed a lunch, and it took us two hours, which isn't long, but it took us two hours to get to Woodstock. And so now we've got two hours to go home. It's a little late. I was really dirty. And I'm glad I brought a change of clothes because she told us there's this great place called Garden Cafe. Okay, and it's vegan. Okay, we'll try it. And we went there, and that was it. It was like, oh yeah, if I can eat like this, I'm going vegan. And I can cook. I'm going to eat like this. We're going vegan. So it took us about four months to transition because of that milk. You know, some people say I'm addicted to milk. They are. They are addicted. Um, there is a chemical in milk that, when we consume it, turns into casein morphine, so like morphine. And so people do go through.、Uh, I went through withdrawal, so I had to have my replacement. So I had rice milk, almond milk. There's Trader Joe's. I have a sample back there. Has a milk creamer. It's a soy milk creamer. It tastes better than. Uh, cream half and half that you put in milk because it doesn't give you that yucky aftertaste, and、um, it's less expensive, less calories, no cholesterol, so healthier. Made from plants, no cruelty, no pus or blood because that's what's in your milk. And so、um, we transitioned.、Um, it helped for me, as with feminism, it hurt. It helped me. To learn what going vegan meant,、um, so I did a few Google searches and I did follow the money trail, and I was really disappointed. And there was nothing humane about any of it. It was just the you know、um, from the straight from the tanning factories where leather is tanned, the pollution that comes from. Um, into the rivers, into the the air that people are breathing who are tanning our leather. It's just anyway, it's really not、um, a good scene.、Um, so I I please urge you to Google and and not take my word for any of this. Please go online, do some research, rent some books, borrow some books, buy some books,、um, volunteer at a farm animal sanctuary. That really helped me.、Um, Baby steps are huge leaps. I've heard of people who go vegan within three days.、Um, they're just they're able to do it. They've found Trader Joe's and that's all they're going to eat, or Whole Foods,、um, and、um, or some yummy chickpeas salads. And so,、um, me going vegan was again for my health, for the health of the environment, and for the health of the、um, animals and Earth. I see that we're at 2:05. This is okay. Oh, oh, oh okay. Just one. So, if you love animals called pets, why eat animals called dinner?、Um, so, this past Sunday,、um, the New York Times had a story of a man, a team who studied dog brains and how they feel that they're very similar to human brains, and so you know, dogs. Have a brain that are smart. We have a brain that's smart. Cows have a bigger brain.、Um, 
you know, you have to start making that connection if you want to be honest with yourself and and be healthy. Also, another thing about being healthy is um, I I had some medical conditions that I had to be on uh, several drugs. Um, that once I went vegan, condition gone. <laughs> no more drugs. No more doctor. No more tests. It was just like what really? Okay, that's great. Uh, I don't have to go to the doctor anymore for that. So um, I lost 30 pounds without even trying. I just, I eat more than I used to. And I love all my food. I could never eat less. <laughs> um, so uh, going vegan is not too hard. Um, it is rather easy nowadays. And um, uh I'm going to cut myself short. So this is The Sexual Politics of Me by Carol J. Adams. Amazing book. Carol um, basically uh, says that the sexual politics of meat is an attitude and an action that animalizes women and sexualizes and feminizes animals. It is also the assumption that men need meat, have the right to meat, and that meat eating is a male activity associated with virility. And um, she also discusses the absent referent. And so, you know, it's right here. Um, you know, she says that, uh, where is it? Right here, you know, advertisement make this process seem innocent. No one seems harmed. The pun, the visual substitution, they are humor by the dominant culture about women and the other animals who are made consumable, made into objects, sexual and species inequality has been made funny to those who benefit from dominance. And that was another thing about feminism is we were, we were challenging the dominant culture. We're standing up and we're saying, no, we're not taking it, but I'll have my steak medium rare. Um, so we've got to make those connections. And the suffering, the suffering, oh, Jen saved you the suffering. I'm sparing you the suffering, too. There's a great video that just came out. In fact, Woodstock Farm Animal Sanctuary. I have some of their pamphlets over there. Their Facebook page um, has it. No blood, no gore, just these two cows that don't want to be killed. And you see what they go through, and it's heart-wrenching. So. Vegan for life. Find alternatives to your favorite foods. You can do it. Veganize your favorite recipes. I uh, made some cheese, uh, some nacho cheese over there, the spicy and regular. That was made from potato, carrot, garlic, onion, and cashews. And it tastes kind of like cheese whiz, wouldn't you guys say? Yeah, it was good. Ah, rockin'. Okay. Um, network with vegans. Join a meetup group like Montclair Vegans. Jen and I are members. You might see us at a potluck or a book signing. Um, take adult school or vegan cooking classes. There's so many popping up. Montclair has them. Morris County has them. Go to vegan eateries in New Jersey, New York City, New York and make a day of it. Like go to Montclair and go to Mundo Vegan and visit me. Um, I hope to be opening next month and we're super excited in a great location. I have a list back there if you want to be on my email blast. I'm still working on our Facebook page but we do have a page for Instagram and Twitter. And also listen to veg friendly podcasts to get the latest on info, info on animal rights. Um, good stuff. Uh, our hen house, Kathy Stevens, there's, um, what is it, Engine 2 Engine? It's, um, this is a triathlete, or s he's amazing, anyway. So I urge you to look this up, good stuff, interesting, you'll feel better, you'll be healthier. Um, so I'll end with, uh, with that, because we're at 12.08. So thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. And we'll take questions now for Jen and I. Or if you need to go snack a little. Uh, so there's hummus, fresh salsa that I made this morning, and then the two different cheeses. Yeah, what's up? Hi, my name is Mark. I'm an Indian gender studies major, so thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I guess my question, I was living in California this summer in the Bay Area, and that's where veganism and vegetarianism really got introduced to me, and I loved it out there. But I guess something I noticed is that this movement for eating healthier, and especially with the connection with feminism, it almost seems elitist when you talk about the, the economic factors into it. Eating healthier costs more money. So for those who are socially economically not able to eat better, it pushes us to eat processed food, especially on the college student budget. So how do we challenge the 
elitism or elitism mm -hmm. surrounding this idea of better living, better eating? That's a good question. I'm going to start by saying that that you have done such a fantastic job of clarifying one of my huge pet peeves, which is that it does ha first. Well, I mean, it does actually cost more. For example, an organic um, pound of fresh broccoli costs more than a conventionally raised pound of fresh broccoli. I'm not saying eat organic for your personal health, but for the health of everyone, because raising, you know, we all know that that crops that are raised in an organic way are actually better for the earth, which tends to be better for our own personal health. So there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of meat alternatives available. Um, you can buy like vegetarian hot dogs, et cetera, et cetera, um, which are, are pricey. They're not as pricey necessarily like the vegetarian um, ground beef. It's called like, do you remember what it's called? I don't remember what it's Lean called. Lean and light. Lean and light or something. That's not actually as expensive as true ground beef but you're right that if you go whole hog and you're like i'm gonna make all my substitutions all the time and eat out at only vegan restaurants which tend to be sometimes a little bit on the pricier side not always and fanny's is going to be an exception um but you can go spend a lot of money being vegan if you aren't careful and i actually work really hard to not spend that much money and also um, sort of dispel that because you can eat pretty well on a budget. Um, you have to be savvy about it and you have to know some tricks and there are a lot of resources both online and people have written some good books about it. There's one called Vegan on $4 a Day is one of them. Um, it involves eating a lot of beans and a lot of whole grains and a lot of like fresh produce or sometimes you just might get it in the freezer section but um it definitely can be done and i would say i i have done it and i'm doing it and i actually am a total like i was raised in massachusetts and i'm a total like yankee thrifty cheapskate so <laughs> i'm never like oh let's you know go spend extra money i right. eat like i put beans in a crock pot and make food out of it later because i'm cheap but yeah i mean that's a huge problem it's it has a um an elitist uh, label that comes with it and I think that f in time we're gonna see that label decrease but you can go to Taco Bell and you can eat vegan and you can you know go to Chipotle and eat vegan like mm. there are what you don't have to go to a vegan restaurant to be vegan and you can I we eat pizza all the time and we just ask for it with no cheese and they know us at the pizza place and they're like oh my son actually doesn't eat cheese and hey he's like get the cheese off my pizza he won't eat vegan cheese or anything and they're like oh there's the kid who always has his pie with no cheese on it so you know it's not it's not an impossible thing to do and if you want I can talk about like specific trips tricks later on sure mm -hmm. sorry Fanny, I took oh yeah no and also to answer that is um I know it's difficult on campus I just saw something in the bathroom and it's you know all chocolate and dairy and all these little signs of what you could get at the market I would say Speak up, man. Say, I'm vegan. I need some options here. Where's my hummus? Where's my black bean uh, spread? Um, because you're it. You're the change. And th as far as it being, I, I, I hear the elitism, but with me, and maybe it's just cooking Latin um, style, you know, I have my rice, my beans. I make it all happen with my rice and beans. And an onion, forget about it. We got a feast. So similar to what you have in the back there, that was a can. I actually, I never use canned tomatoes, but I was, I've been running on a budget. So I had some canned tomatoes, and that's what I made that salsa from. So it was half an onion, some salsa. I mean, the canned tomatoes, um, just like Jen says. There's tricks. There's that book, How to Eat on $4 a Day. Um, I just went to the supermarket yesterday. I got a pound of chickpeas for two thirty nine. I can't get a pound of well, maybe I can get a pound of chicken. I don't think that. so. But you know, it's just kind of you got to make that best decision. What what's best for me? But anyway, okay. I hope I answered your question. I also just want to add, it also can involve um, re-educating yourself if you're used to cooking or having food cooked for you in a certain way. And that was very much, I think, both of our experiences and many, many, many people who have made the transition to vegetarianism or veganism who were raised in a certain way 
um, my my family is full of meat eaters, and they still are totally mystified by my decision. And they're like, well, whatever you want to do, enjoy it. But I'll tell you, at Christmas, um, we celebrate with my family on Christmas Eve, and we always have pizza. And my our cheeseless pizza is the with a lot of vegetables on it is always the first to go. Like there's n and and no one will cop to it. They're never like, oh, that was actually good. But I've gone back to get my first slice before and have had none left. And we don't have a very big family. So um, it's also a matter of just sort of learning new cooking techniques if that's not what you were raised to be comfortable with or have learned to be comfortable with if you've learned to cook as an adult yourself. Yeah, hi. Um, do you have any comments on like Chipotle's new campaign with food with integrity and their little scarecrow and just well, I mean, here's the thing. For me per personally, and Fanny has a different story, I eat at Chipotle. I go there. My son has been eating there since he was tiny and knows, like, he'll roll in and get his, you know, bean and rice bowl or whatever. And I appreciate the fact that when I'm traveling throughout the country there, I can generally know that I can head to a Chipotle and have a healthy meal, like not a totally, like, pristinely great meal, but a pretty healthy meal. With that said, they, I think, I, I know this, the campaign that they're talking about, Food with Integrity, but also, I mean, behind, behind that is nothing I'm like divulging as like secret, you know, undercover stuff, but it was in the news quite a bit, which is that they're pulling in animals that have been treated with antibiotics and necessarily, um, are not quite the same standards of meat that they have been sort of touting that they use the entire time. And I think we can all figure out why. It's because the, the supply of that kind of meat does not meet the current demand for that. So they've had to actually repattern or are poised to repattern their buying practices because they, they are continuing to serve meat and they need to have the chicken for the tacos and the, you know, the pork for their, what is the pork, I don't forgot what the pork one is. Um, but you know what I'm saying, like, th that's, that's the backstory. They're being a little bit disingenuous in my opinion, but at the same time, sometimes when I'm out and I'm hungry, I go there and eat. Yeah, I don't, I don't eat at Chipotle and, um, Chipotle, and, uh, I saw the Scarecrow, if anyone, ha if, no, if you haven't seen it yet, it's heart-wrenching, it's a yes. short little commercial video for Chipotle, and, um, it's it's heartwarming, warming, and it also just made me think. Like a few of my friends said, Chipotle is going vegan because they make such an argument that it's so awful. But yeah, I mean, if you have a chance <laughs> to check it out, if you haven't seen it, you should. It's eye opening. I mean, I appreciate the fact that they are getting people to talk. Like we're having this discussion right now, right? So right. perfect. Right. I agree. Uh, please thank Fanny. Thank and Jennifer, and we'll conclude because I really want to respect your time. I know it's 12.15. Um, please take food, take literature, but first let's say thank you. Thanks, guys.